successive leader from a Welsh constituency. Oh, 
school and I dare say when Ari left school the first thing your parents would say you are not going underground well if they were if they were anything like me I insisted on going underground why was that because I wanted to go underground why was that well because my father being underground it's just something you knew I'm not saying it's in everybody but it is in me 
I wanted to go underground, and that was an end to it. I could have had a job in a nice warm factory if I wanted to. Matter of fact, I went, I left school, went down to a factory in Tylerstown, stood on the door, put my head in, and I came away without even having an interview. And I went straight to the Abraham and Training Centre over in Aberdeer, signed on as a trainee, done my training, and underground. And what was it that attracted you to the industry when you were 16? Well, my mates were down here. And uh, as I say, the comradeship was there. Well, that, that's all I can say. The comradeship was there. My mates were there. I mean, we go out every night drinking together. We go in the club. We talk about it mm -hmm. in the club. We go back down the following day and we talk about the club. And we come up the following day, we go in the club, talk about the pit. You know, it's conversation that automatically comes out. Because uh, when you're in the club, you always get some clever dick saying, oh, aye, the dust is laying on you, put the water on. It's, uh, it's comical in a way, you know what I mean? But it's general conversation. Anybody who started in the mining industry, they will always remember their first week, they will remember their first few weeks, because without a doubt, it is a very, very hard job. And one thing I can always remember about it, going down the pit, and like you said, it was very dark. I thought, good God, you know, uh, it's just something I hadn't actually experienced before. And I was shoved, uh, put into a coal face straight away uh, with supervision of a, a person, namely at that particular time, was Mr. Tom Jones. He was my supervisor, and he trained me. Uh, I can always remember my knees being so uh, oh, little cuts everywhere, you know, over my well, over my hands. It's not you used to bump your hands. I, uh, one other thing you used to remember, I used to go home from work. There was no bars in those days, as you know, Chris, uh, just collapsed in the chair for two or three hours. And I was a young fella, you can say, 17 years of age, then going into the mining industry and really fit. But uh, I used to come home really, really shattered at that time. And... Uh, so what would you do when you got home at the end of the day? Well, I'll be honest, Chris, like I said, I'd collapse in a chair for a hour or two, and no different to anybody else, because they all done it. Then we get a shower, a bath, and uh, you would go out for a few hours in the evening. Uh, and then you'd be dreading the following day coming, because you think, well, God help me, I'm going back to the same thing that I'd done yesterday. And, uh, you know, doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, and knowing damn well, I've got to say this, and you're not bettering yourself, because it's a type of industry that I don't think you can better yourself. There are certain jobs you can, but majority don't do it. This is going to be your, it's going to be your type of work for the rest of your life, you know, right? They always used to say that mining made men out of boys. 
Yes, and I will agree with that without a doubt, because the yeah. point is, and um, uh, if I can say from my own experience, and Arthur will tell you the same, um, when you put a lamp and you put a helmet on, right, and you go down that shaft and you go into that face, right, you become a man, without a doubt. It changes your character, it, it changes your outlook on life, because it's something you've experienced, experience that you've never experienced before. I think there is a, a natural uh, pride in miners, uh, not only in Mardi, I think in every pit, you know. And sometimes it's underrated. And sometimes people criticise miners for being uh, irresponsible. Or whatever. I've never seen miners irresponsible on the ground. They do take a pride in their work because they believe that in the conditions that they work, sometimes, you know, potentially dangerous uh, conditions, they have that in the back of their mind, so they've got to do the job to the best of their ability. They can't afford to be flippant about the kind of work that they do, you know, and that's why they build in this kind of pride. I think that's the real reason, is the safety factor that comes into it. There's over a thousand men in the Ronda alone died in explosions. Some of the worst explosions um, in, uh, in Great Britain were in the Ronda. Terrible ones. As a matter of fact, in Mardi, uh, there were 81 men killed on Christmas Eve, which sounds, you know, terrible, doesn't it? Uh, before the turn of the century, there were 81 men killed on Christmas, Christmas Eve. Can you just imagine the, the terrible suffering that went on during that period? The pneumoconiosis in the Ronda. Uh, the highest in 
I believe that around in the middle of the coal field had the highest incidence of pneumoconiosis anywhere in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, wiped out, wiped out, uh, if I could say, faces of men. My father can tell me that there were men during his period, because he had to come up from underground because of miners nystagmus, a disease of the eyes. Uh, and uh, he, he, he tells me, and, and you can hear it from many men, you know, from many older miners, that there were men who worked on faces then of 20 to 30 men who worked on faces where the coal cutters were introduced, the early days of the coal cutter, where there was no uh, water suppression, uh, where the dust conditions were, were, were so, so bad that within a, very, oh, within a very short period, two or three years, men were contracting dust. And what he tells me that there were men in the early 20s were dying of dust. And this common knowledge that there were certain faces in Tylerstown and Ferndale of men, and not one of them survived because they all died of pneumoconiosis. Because when they introduced the cutters, they found the cutter as a means of increasing production, but water suppression was a secondary thing, and water suppression came in years and years later. <laughs> taught certain codes that are passed along from older miners to younger miners, you know, about being extremely careful about certain parts, about a part of ground, an awareness, an instinct that's built into you that you've got to be careful of a certain ground that you're working under. But I don't think anybody's ever complacent in faces or on roadways, because the accident rate now, although it's not serious, not serious accidents, the accident rate now is still not... Uh, not what we'd like it to be, you know, but ne men never take it for granted that what, what they're going into will be the same as it was the day before. It alters continually, and I believe men are always, uh, you know, aware of the fact that they can change. Were you pleased when your son decided to go down the pit? Yeah, I was pleased for more than one reason, because the unemployment situation in the Ronda is appalling. And when he left school, uh, he was one of the last batch to come into Mardi. <laughs> you're concerned mining is a safe job today safe by comparison to what it used to be uh, and the regulations and the insistence of our union on carrying out safety and health regulations has improved a lot of the miner tremendously and as far as pneumoconiosis is concerned you know well, it's just not always acceptable and once if you look at some of the roadways in Mardi, you'd think christ it wouldn't take a long for a amount of dust in these roadways but there is a monitoring system that is continually in use in this pit as every other pit that monitors the dust uh, uh, and uh, if it goes above an acceptable level then the, the, the management are obligated to do something about it you know these things have come in over over a period of years and they're good they're good for the miner they protect the miner and uh, accident rates as well have dropped as a result of this
fourth generation. My son is the fourth generation of miners. My, father, my grandfather came here from just outside Taunton in 1905. The same as so many came around about that period after 1900, you know, before the First World War. And uh, as there's been mining in my family continuously until uh, Robert, uh, my son, hopefully will uh, continue to be a miner. I don't know whether he will be, and I don't think anybody else knows. You know, uh, but it, it is uh, there's a lot of sadness about it because with the mining, with, with mining, as mining goes, so something else goes with it—a community, a spirit, a confidence in, in in your ability to fight back. Because mining was what is a catalyst of people's feelings. You know that they could surround themselves around the local miners lodge, around the local lodge leadership to fight back against something that they detested. <laughs> you can see the rift between us men and those pigs there. Oh, I, I would say the atmosphere down the colliery is fantastic. Uh, to anybody who worked in factories, I'd be honest, or, or outside work, right? Uh, is a different atmosphere altogether because of terrible comparison. Or go back about four years ago where we recruited a number of men, all right, at the colliery, and they did come from factories, they come from outside work, and they didn't believe the atmosphere that took place in the ground. Um, for instance, if I can explain to you, you can have a crossword with your, with your buddy, but that's forgotten within, within two minutes. You're the best of friends straight away, without a doubt. There's no grudge old held at all. And uh, I mean that, and that's after the battle where a lot of us boys came into the mining in industry because the atmosphere was something different that we knew from outside work, you know, right? Like. I think probably, you know, Chris, that uh, that's why the mining industry is known uh, for it, you know. Uh, we're a, they say we're a different breed of people. I don't wonder on times, are we? But I think we are because the, the way we react, you know, like. Right? Um, for instance, uh, someone's in trouble, all right? That, the team, the work that you say of the team, they are all behind that person, all right? And without a doubt. Which I don't think you'd pawn certain times. You don't get it in an outside industry, you know, like? Well, I work in outside industry, Chris, in mm. factories. It's about three factories, you know. Mm. And I've seen a difference, a big difference. Mm. Because, uh, as Ari said there, you know, there's no unity there. You know, if one man is in dispute in a factory, it's, uh, brother, you jump, I'm all right. I'm carrying on work and I'm not going to lose the money through you. You stand on your own two feet and fight your own case. And that's what it is. There's a lot of backstab in it. Mm. And more so in factories uh, than anywhere else. But down this place, is in a different kettle of fish altogether. Everybody, like I said, is together. All together, you know. If one's in trouble, we're all together. My father actually worked 51 years in the coal mining industry. Uh, I worked alongside my father, and on certain times it really broke my heart. I could have, I could have got on the side of him and started crying, I'll be honest, you know, like, I had a man of 60 odd years of age working on a coal face, uh, at 65 years of age, I mean, 
and what we call orthodox, that's sh all shuttle work. Now I thought that's not the way I want to end up. And uh, no disrespect to what the union was years ago, because they fought hard, they, they made the union what it is today. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, they didn't quite achieve what they should have achieved for the elite people who was there years ago. For instance, my father, you know, I guess, just stated all that time on working on a coal face or on the coal line. When he ended his days up, he ended it up with 200 pounds. And my father thought, good God, he thought it was a fortune. And I always remember, trying to explain to my father, for God's sake, Dad, I said, 200 pounds is neither you nor there, and it's not going to happen to me. So I thought, from that day on, I'm going to get involved with the trade union. And I thought to myself, well, if, if I can make things better for, us, for the you know, coal mining industry in my own little way, and especially for retired miners and the widows who at that particular time was receiving nothing whatsoever, because I can go back um, in my days, because we could have a large family. There were six boys and one daughter. Uh, my father worked all his life, uh, and my brothers worked as well, and there was, what you could say, at that particular time, there was fair money coming in the house, if we thought fair money. But I remember the conditions, what we went through. Uh, for instance, um, <laughs> you had a meal, if there's anything left over, that wasn't thrown out without a doubt. That was kept for the following day, different to what it is today. Um, you know, for for instance, um, Mum or Dad, uh, well, I actually today I say I can afford to go out and on Sundays I can enjoy myself. My father used to go out once on a Sunday. He'd go out about seven o'clock and he would be back in the house about nine o'clock because he had no more money to spend. And that's after working six days, not five days. And well, certain weeks he'd work seven days to fetch a living wage home. And it was really struggle. My mother never had nothing out of life. She worked hard all her life, really hard. She fetched a big family up. For my mother to go to the pictures once a week, that was her life. That was her highlight of her life. Anyway, she wouldn't have nothing else whatsoever. So what I'm saying, you know, Chris, I wouldn't allow that to happen to me, and I wouldn't allow it, allow it to happen to the uh, younger generation, because I thought to myself, we're not going back to the old days with the surfs and bloody kings. We've had enough of that, like. <laughs> Why do you think it is that Ronda miners have the reputation of being so militant? It comes from, again, a pride. A pride that Ronda took the lead in so many struggles, took the lead in, in the fight against unemployment in the 30s, in the Depression, a fight, the fight against the means test, and uh, a militancy that's been a part of Ronda miners and part of Ronda history particularly in the trade union movement, particularly in the trade union movement, more than the, than the political movement, is that the leadership of lodges invariably came from the, well, uh, from socialists or communists. And that's, you know, th that's had its effect in the, over the years on the men themselves that work in the, in the pits, you know. And why did you yourself become a union man at a young age? Because I was a part of a family of four, my father was a surface man, three sisters and myself, and I saw, although the man, uh, although my father done his best to disguise it, I believe, I saw a certain amount of deprivation and poverty, the same as everybody else in our street and every other street in the Ronda saw it, you know, uh, of a man trying difficulty, uh, extreme difficulty in bringing a family up, and a very, um, under bad conditions, working long hours, often coming home soaked to the bloody skin, and other miners in the street where pneumoconiosis was common, where death from dust was common, you know. And uh, I believe this consciousness, this feeling of anger, built into it also a feeling of consciousness of what can be done about it. And uh, I found that uh, the best way to do something about it was to stand up and be counted, you know, with others and say, right, this is, uh, we've got to improve the conditions. And I believe the reason why I became uh, um, interested in the union, as I have since I was 18, uh, since I was 20 years of age, is because, to the best of my ability, with others, to try and improve the lot of miners. Safety first, wages and conditions after, yeah.
We've got a very, very young workforce today in this coal field. And it's a workforce uh, they've never seen struggle. They can have their TVs today, they can have their videos, they can have their cars, they can have their houses, they can have their holidays. And that's all they care about today. You know, the militancy isn't there. It's a case of starting all over again, re-educating or trying to get the education into these youngsters to show them that there is still a struggle. You know, we, we've got to drive it on to them that there is still a struggle on to survive. But at this particular moment in time, we're nowhere near it. Nowhere near it at all. And since this, uh, this bonus scheme have come into the coal field, it's even made things worse. It split us right down the middle. There's no doubt about it. Because the president we've got is the president we should have had during Joe Gormley's days. And I don't think we'd have been in the position we are now. Some of the boys, they are born comedians without a doubt, and they don't realize it. And the sense of humor that goes through the, the mine or whatever district you're working at, then, you know, you, you can feel it there, you know, like without a doubt. Uh, some of my crack a joke, you know, like, and you're walking, uh, walking on together, and when I, the other ten yards, you'll get one of the other boys cracking a joke, you know, like, and they're all trying to beat each other and crack a joke to get the biggest laugh. It's that type of industry, you know, like, so the, the humor is there, without a doubt, like. <laughs> The pit's a very male world, isn't it? Definitely a male world. Yes, definitely. <clears throat> Where this McGregor says he can start women in the in the pits here in the, in uh, Great Britain. Not in a million years. If he wants to start anybody in these pits, let him start the youngsters on the door. We don't want no women on the pits. We want our youngsters down the pit. Why don't you want women down the pit? Because they have enough room in the house. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Honestly, when you talk about women on the pit, I mean, you've seen for yourselves the heavy work and tail on the road, mm. such as I'm being rings about. I'm being this about. It's not on. It wouldn't work. I think these women they got down these American mines, they're fairies. There's no hard work entailed to whatever work they're doing. They couldn't do it. It's impossible. But as I say, rather than start women down the mines, let's have our own people down the mines. My son, Ari's son, and other people involved in this industry, they are sons. Before any women, then we think of the women. So are you hoping your son will be able to start down the pit? Yes, hopefully yes. Hopefully yes. Because at this present moment of time, he's just left school, he's 16 years of age. He's on the dole. He plays rugby for the local uh, local rugby club, which is Tylerstown. The only thing that does occupy his mind is playing records, going out training, and looking forward to a game of rugby. As for a job, well, we just got to wait and see, which I can't see. 
anything at all coming to the valleys. So he's unemployed at the moment? Unemployed at the moment, yes. And it looks to be a long, long time before he'll have a job, the way things are looking. Is his name down for the pit? His name is down for the pit, yes. Yes. Whether he'll have a job, I don't know. Hopefully, and hopefully I'm saying, hopefully he will. If he can't get a job at the pit, where else could he find a job in this Rondo Valley? Nowhere. Nowhere at all. Well, if I can say on behalf of my son, you know, James, which is 14 and a half, he's still at school, and he's simple like Arthur's, and he's, he's full of sport. Uh, he wants everything in the school, um, and, you know, I try to provide him and my wife too with what we can. But uh, for the future, I can't see nothing here for my boy or, or even my family, because the point is that there is no industry, there's no money to be earned. And uh, I think, you know, personally myself, that uh, uh, the quicker the my boy, when he gets old enough, that he'll, he'll be on the move, he'll move from here, like, you know, without a doubt. How, do you, how do you feel about that? I would really break my heart, without a doubt, I, you know, because then, um, after all, um, uh, he, he's my boy, and uh, he's only, I got a daughter, like I explained to you, he's 29, and James is uh, 14 and a half. There's a big gap between the ages, and um, James is uh, like really part of my life, without a doubt. Wherever he goes at a particular moment, I am with him. Wherever he goes playing football, I follow him. Uh, he makes my weekend for me, and without a doubt, like. So, uh, foreseeing that there's a possibility that in the future that he could move away from here, uh, I would really be despondent, without a doubt, like. club one night and this, this is the experience they give to me, right? There was 46 of us sitting in the club in the lounge and when I looked around and I looked at myself, there were six of us employed all, out of the 46, so there's 40 of them that there was unemployed or put redundant. So 40 I, men out of 46? Yes, there was definitely 40 of them in the room that was uh, and either unemployed or been redundant out of a job. So I'm going to say, you know, if we lose these amount of jobs in Mardi, I can see uh, the problem getting greater, mm -hmm. without a doubt. It, it, it will have a, a massive effect on the community, without a doubt. If there's no money uh, to be earned or to work for, right, you can't spend what you haven't got. And I can see it rebuffing back on clubs, shopkeepers, well, whatever you wish to think of, you know, like. I think it will be a drastic effect. I, mean, I think, personally myself, it could be the end of the community. Uh, a lot of people might not uh, believe me in saying this, but I have seen what it's done to my own uh, little community, Blind Fafe. It uh, definitely have affected our little community, without a doubt, uh, because uh, actually working on books in Mardi from Blind Fafe, and we must realise there's no other industry around, there are about 30 people. Uh, I think the population of Blind, for instance, it could be up to about two to 3,000 people. Well, you take uh, 30 working on that, it's ridiculous, isn't it? We've got a commitment that we're not going to allow them there on the valley to die, you know, and this is the last bit and can contract into something that is totally different to what it is now and totally ineffective, perhaps. But it's a very, um, it's a subject that we, with other people, have got to get together and discuss and try and do something about because we failed three years ago. We called a meeting in Ferndale Workman's Hall. I can remember the time we called it, it was three or four years ago, I'm not sure. And we decided that we were going to do something. So we called a meeting, asking people to come to, to this meeting to discuss unemployment and what can we do about it. Because we felt strong, we felt angry about it, that so many youngsters were leaving school. And not only youngsters, older people, as a, you know, as an older generation. And we talked, uh, and, and we called this meeting, and, and nobody turned up except the lodge officials. So there's been a complacency, even amongst the unemployed, that they can't do anything about it, you know. So there's got to be somebody has got to sort of rejuvenate confidence in people that they can fight and struggle to get work, I believe, anyway.
you think there's any hope of your son ever getting a job at Mardi? At this present moment of time, no. No. No, not, not at this present moment of time. Not with this, uh, this linker we got coming off with Tower now. Which, which was said last night on the news, there'll be 200, or, 200 and odd redundancies already in the pipeline. And I think we can visualize as a lodge a lot more than 200 coming along. So I can't ever, ever see my son working in Mardi. Perhaps if he went up the Yorkshire way, or Nottingham way, or any one of the coal fees up in England, yes, perhaps he would have a start up there. But as far as around the valley is concerned, definitely no. How do you feel about that? Terrible. <clears throat> really terrible. When you realize that the, 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 there's mining, the mining in this valley have been going on for hundreds of years. There's coal reserves here to be got for Mardi. I want to say for Mardi, just for Mardi, and that if, we'd had the, if we could have the investment and the recruitment that we put into Mardi, we'd have a viable pit, a pit on its own, most definitely, because I think, well not think, we know the reserves in Mardi are tremendous. There's about 20 to 25 years work yet, if not more. Thank you. 